Hello, everyone. Um, we're excited to welcome you today for our March uh, pediatric Miami Pediatric Neurosurgery Zymposium. Uh, today's topic that we're going to talk about is spinal deformity and fusion in patients with spina bifida. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Niazi, who's going to introduce our speakers for this month. All right. Well, thank you for um, joining us today. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing two of our speakers and uh, three of our moderators today. So um, our first speaker is Dr. Mari Groves. She comes to us from Johns Hopkins University. She also um, moonlights a little bit um, and, and helps out at University of Maryland, where she's uh, really the head of the pediatric um, neurosurgical spine service there. Um, and then we have Dr. Steve Huang, um, who's uh, coming to us from Shriners Hospital in Philadelphia. He's also part of the St. Christopher's Hospital uh, staff. Um, in terms of our moderators, uh, we're really fortunate to have a little smattering of both pediatric and uh, orthopedic um, colleagues here. We have Dr. John Ashgar, who's an adult and pediatric spinal surgeon um, from the Paley Orthopedic um, and Spine Institute. Uh, Dr. Richard Sanderson, who um, comes to us from NYU Langone. Uh, he is a professor uh, there at the Pediatric Neurosurgery Department. Um, and Jennifer Strawley, who's coming to us from um, Washington University. She She's um, an associate professor of neurosurgery there uh, in orthopedic surgery and pediatrics. She's the director of the pediatric neurospine program and the director of the pediatric cerebrovascular surgery program. So I want to thank you all for joining us. Um, and we look forward to um, uh, this talk. So thank you. So I'll be talking about kyphectomy, which is a very specific condition with uh, in patients with myeloma, you know, meningocele. And so these are my disclosures, nothing relevant to this talk. Uh, so it, you know, we know, as neurosurgeons, we know myelomeningocele patients very well, uh, <clears throat> and from the neuro side, the hydrocephalus side, uh, and even the scoliosis point of view, but they really have two primary deformities that are uh, one unique to the, these patients. And so scoliosis is one of them, and about anywhere from 23 to 88% of children with myelomeningocele can develop scoliosis. This is you know, often tied with a level of function, the level of deformity. So in some of the series, the patients who have a thoracic uh, deficit basically have a high incidence going up to about 90% of developing scoliosis. Whereas often patients who have a lower, like a sacral myelo tend to be closer to eight or 10% or so. Uh, so generally overall, it's about 50%, uh, which is a significant risk. And then the secondary diagnosis, so the secondary deformity we see sometimes is kyphosis, really a thoracolumbar kyphosis where these patients develop uh, really excessively abnormal thoracolumbar kyphosis leading to postural issues. So about eight to 20% of patients can develop uh, this deformity, sometimes perinatally, right at birth. And there's a reasonable risk of progression in this as well, about four to 13 degrees per year in some series uh, over time. So I'll talk about both of these topics in a little more detail. So with, oops, I'm gonna move this around. So <clears throat> with scoliosis in myelo patients, you know, really the indications to intervene and operate are really progressive curvature leading to things such as pain, sitting, in, sitting imbalance, gastrointestinal issues, compression of the abdominal content, leading to poor feeding or poor feed tolerance, cardiopulmonary functions or good respiratory function over time, and pelvic obliquity, which ties into the poor sitting balance. This can be related to pressure sores if they're really sitting obliquely and have a lot of pressure on one side, uh, they may form decubit eye and you know, they have difficulty healing those. And really the goals around surgery tend to be around the same as the indications. Really we're trying to improve and stabilize the curve so it doesn't progress uh, and then correct what we can. And really try to get them to sit better, so balance the pelvis. You know, arbitrarily people pick um, 10 degrees or less as a target goal, but we try to get as level as we can. And then really try to level the shoulders and keep them balanced overall. Uh, and so when you look at the pelvis, the shoulders, the goal is really to instrument these patients so that they don't progress. And ideally they're more comfortable, easy to care for but truly are we helping those patients? And that's something that's a, you know, a little controversial. You know, they have a high complication rate. So when you look at the literature, myelo patients, you know, there's a category of neuromuscular scoliosis. Myelo patients tend to have a higher risk of complication than some of the more mild CP patients. Anywhere from uh, 40 to 63% of patients with the myelin, the different series in the literature have complications post-op. Uh, and in, in the CP populations, it's pretty similar. In some series, up to 65% of CP patients have post-op complications after deformity correction. Uh, and the question is, are we really helping them? And so, you know, this multiple studies looking at sitting balance, and we certainly improve how they sit, uh, and sometimes the care and the caregivers are happy. Uh, there's not as much in terms of, uh, you know, really patient quality measures comparing how they did before and after. 
In the CP literature, there's a little bit more now. So if we actually extrapolate from the CP population, uh, you know, the Boston group have published some data looking at uh, their post-op outcomes and patients improved, like this graph showed in the CP child score, about a one year post-op, and then they declined again, actually, to about two years. And then they have some other data coming out that even up to five years after, it seems to go back to their baseline. Uh, so the question is, are we actually benefiting them by putting to them, you know, big surgery with a lot of risk uh, and potentially a lot of harm uh, for like smaller benefit. There's increasing data coming out now. So the harm study group actually has some prospective data at two years suggesting that CP patients actually do better. Uh, and they, you know, they're happier with the outcome, the quality of care is better. Uh, so that's a little bit controversial. There's data on both sides for that. Uh, but that's still not answered for the myelo population. Now the diagnosis is obviously very different. Uh, myelo meningocele patients are, you know, have typically high verify cognitive function. So they're very aware of the environment. And so they actually may have greater benefit than we see in some of the very severely uh, disabled CP patients. And then what's the impact of uh, basically tethered cord release and scoliosis? So uh, Mumoretti had a nice review paper in 2017, really summarized you know, what little literature we have talking about the impact of tethered cord release and deformity. And this is strictly talking about scoliosis. We'll talk about kyphosis in more depth after. Uh, and you know, a couple of papers will look at the incidence and really intervening um, might help in some cases. The meta paper suggested 41% of paper patients retethered by a year after detethering them. And then there's Bowman had a prospective study and a retrospective study suggesting about 50% had progressive deformity after release. Other papers have suggested even some improvement after. Uh, the Herman paper, Sawark, all had a little bit of improvement. Uh, some of it tied to the curve magnitude at the initial time, like the McClone paper. But overall, in the literature, nonetheless, it's a very high risk of progression, even after telecore release. Uh, and then most of the data showing improvement is about one year. So really, is it sustained two, three years out is probably less likely. And at least these patients end up more progressive uh, deformity as well. More specific to detethering in neuromuscular and uh, myelomeningocele patients is you need to detether them before deformity correction. So, you know, the Bowman paper prospect looked at this and actually had, you know, reported a 4% risk of neurologic worsening, 6% risk of CSF leak, and a significant, uh, significant association of infection or post-op wound issues, uh, which is not trivial. And so the question is, do you have to detether them before, which is a classic approach uh, we've done more historically, especially in North America, we tend to detether these patients and then could be four weeks, six weeks after they heal, go and do the deformity correction. Uh, and really, there's not a lot of literature to answer this. Uh, and some Danny and all my colleagues at the Shrine looked at this in 2007 in a small series of 17 patients. None were detethered, but none were symptomatic. None had any obvious, uh, you know, diagnosis of recurrent tethered cord at the time. One patient had worsening of the lower extremities and transient weakness that resolved. Um, and this is the demographic of the population. And they suggest that maybe it's not necessary to detether all these patients before deformity corrections, again, as long as they're asymptomatic. And the question is, is there a bit of a paradigm shift as well? So there, there's increasing publications coming out, a lot from China as well, looking at patients with different congenital abnormalities without releasing the underlying tethering, it could be a slight cord malformation, a fatty phylum or things, especially if they're asymptomatic before the deformity correction. So this is something I think we're gonna see more of, uh, and I think be a great topic to discuss after as well, but really branch into, is it really necessary to detether these patients before you correct the deformity? Uh, and that's something we just don't truly know. Uh, and now specifically with, lum, you know, with uh, myelomeningus patients, they have unique deformity with you know, lumbar kyphosis. So some are born perinatally with this, and you can see basically in the thoracolumbar spine, they have excessive kyphosis that can lead to clinical sequelian problems. You know, pathophysiologically, we think it's because of lack of posterior elements, so that you know the open neural tube defect, basically there's no bone in the back of the musculature. They have paraspinal musculature and the psoas muscle in the front that leads to unopposed excessive kyphotic force, and that leads to thoracolumbar kyphosis. And then when they're born, that can be an issue with closure. So sometimes children have open wounds that don't heal and lead to sepsis and hygienic problems. Uh, and sometimes often plastic surgery is involved to try to help with that. So typically surgical indications for uh, kyphosis or excessive kyphosis tend to be non-healing ulcers and ulcerations of the skin, functional impairments similar to myelo, uh, to, defor to scoliosis deformity. So if they're sitting poorly or really improper sitting balance, and ultimately it can lead to abdominal compromise or pulmonary compromise. So if they're kind of sitting forward too much, they compressed abdominal space, 
It may form a compensatory thoracic lordosis, which we know leads to poor pulmonary function as well. And all these things can cause clinical problems. And then ultimately pain or sitting balance, such as depicted in this child. Uh, initially, the you know, treatment was this was described in 1968 by Sherard, and uh, often they did neonates. They would uh, kind of do a VCR, corticate the bone perinatally, and put a suture in the front and pack the graft in the front to provide correction. Uh, and they actually had pretty reasonable results from this series. The management options are varied quite widely. So casting has been one option in the literature, especially earlier, instrument to non-instrument diffusion, uh, you know, basically onlay grafts, whether you ligate the fecal sac is uh, an issue of debate as well, and then how you get fixation of the pelvis. These you know, children often have no bone in the back or lack of posterior column elements, which lead to poor fixation. So some people advocate anterior, you know, anterior fusion instrumentation as well. And so there's different fixation techniques you can use to support these patients. Uh, these are some, some of the kind of debates and some of the different techniques. So the Warner Fackler is a unique technique that on the left, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but unique technique basically where they do a VCR, take out the kyphotic segment, uh, and then they use a rod that's bent like an L, put it through the foramen of S1 and kind of cantilever on the back, reducing the kyphosis and basically putting wires at the top across the, the bony elements. Uh, and then Dunn McCarthy, they both came out with a different technique over time, fixation over the pelvis. It's similar, but essentially you fix it over the pelvis and instead of putting it through the sacral foramen, you can actually apply the force over the, the pelvis itself. And then more commonly adopted nowadays are pelvic screws. This is probably more, more people are comfortable with it and used to it. So some kind of iliac fixation is probably the more commonplace fixation now. And then the question of, should you ligate the fecal sac? So the different series suggesting initially you could, uh, because it definitely facilitates a surgery. Instead of trying to work around a fecal sac, uh, tie around the nerve roots, you can just transect it, elevate it out of the field, and you work directly in the vertebral body. It's, it's certainly much simpler in many ways. Uh, and you know, the pros are, it makes the surgery easier maybe get less CSF leak unless you're concurrently repairing it, but typically you tie off the fecal sac and I really worried about CSF leak. In the literature, they've had a lot of blood loss with this procedure, but I think things have changed a little bit over time. And then the downside is, could you have, you know, in the literature, there's a couple of cases reported of increasing shunt problems after you tie off the fecal sac. And so hypothetically, people talked about buffering space for a CSF volume. Uh, truly, it may just be a poorly functioning shunt. There was teetering at the edge that pushed over or maybe inflammation from the surgery if leg got into the CSF space, certainly that could contribute to a shunt malfunction that wasn't working great to start. Uh, and then lastly, or do they have some function that's not appreciated and can you make them worse after? And then we'll talk a little bit about a case series from Boston Children's where four children did get worse post-op. Altic had a paper of 33 patients, which is pretty much a comparable large size of series for, uh, for kyphectomies. And in this series, and not uncommonly, there's one death from bleeding typically. So there's a significant amount of blood loss from these surgeries, one shunt malfunction, and overall 17 complications in the children. Co had a paper where two of the nine patients had shunt problems about a month after surgery. And that's what raised the question of, you know, if you're tying off the fecal sac, is this associated or is this just coincidental? Uh, Pontaria et al., which is the Boston Children's Group, had a series of four uh, where they all described patients being incontinent after tying off the fecal sac. So none of them were truly incontinent before, uh, and they did fecal sac ligation, and then post-op these forward, which can be a dramatic effect on you know, these children who don't have lower extremity function, being incontinent can really affect their quality of life. And then, so they recommended just doing urodynamic testing on all these patients preoperatively to get a true assessment of the disease function and you can knock that out during the surgery. It's certainly a good idea. And then when you actually take out the VCR, classically, uh, it was done by VCR, so you just take out the whole vertebral body. And so in the top left, you can see a depiction of this, where essentially whatever kyphotic levels are, you take it out, and then you just put a cage or some kind of strike graft in the front to pivot across it and reduce them. Lenke published a different technique of decancellation VCR, where essentially you're taking out the marrow and all the bone inside and just leaving a thin rim of bone where you crack and overpower uh, the argument that's a little safer because you're not at risk of hitting the vessels in the front uh, and manipulating the order or the branches close to it. And so the, some people have used the decancellation technique similarly to correct kyphectomy and just close across those spaces, uh, not requiring a cage in the front as well. Uh, so there's lots of variation, different approaches to this and different techniques to this, uh, but are we really helping the children? So you know, we talked about this in the myelo patients a little bit. 
uh, meaning for the scoliosis, are you really making them better? You're putting them through a significant amount of risk. Uh, and there's not a, there's even less literature in kyphectomy patients. Peterson, which is a multi-center Brazilian group, had a series of 31 patients, uh, mean age of about 10 years, so young kids. And they basically they showed similar to in the literature improvement in the radiographic kyphosis of 130 degrees to 56 degrees, which is pretty consistent across the board. They actually had Pete's QL questionnaires pre-op and a two years post-op looking at how these children did. 70% had complications, which is again is unfortunately on par with what's normal. Uh, and then they also said basically those Pete's QL questions improved from 71 to 76, which was statistically significant, but just within the MCID. So the argument was, are we really helping these kids by putting through, you know, 70% of these kids had a complication and have prolonged issues? Are we really helping them by improving the Pete's QL score by five points? Uh, but truly they don't have, you don't have a comparator in this group. So we don't really know what, how children who are untreated do. So if you don't treat them and they progress, you know, what's the, what are the consequences of that? How does that impact the quality of life, pulmonary function, sitting balance, and all these things? Uh, so, you know, hopefully in the future, we'll have a little bit more information, but that still remains unanswered. And then another question that comes around kyphectomy is really when should you intervene? Uh, you know, in historically, patients were treated early, I think partially because it was harder to close the ulcers in the back uh, with improved surgical techniques and plastic surgery involvement. I think that's better now. Uh, but, you know, the argument to make to intervene early is the bones smaller and the blood volume smaller, which is more dangerous. They have worse fixation. It's hard to instrument, you know, neonate, really. Uh, and then you may impair growth. If you do a long contract fusion, they're not going to grow across those segments that are fused or instrumented uh, that could affect pulmonary development and respiratory function. However, on the early side, they're more flexible. The spines are probably, curves are probably smaller, which is less deformity, maybe easier to do. And hopefully they'll have better sitting balance early on for a portion of their lives. And the compensatory curves may not be as bad. That's thoracic hyperlordosis may not be as excessive. And that may, you know, you may intervene before that significantly affects pulmonary function. Vice versa, the same arguments, you know, and the, are the contrary arguments for late intervention in these kids. Uh, there's a couple series that historically was done early in the neonates. So Sharand initially described in 68 and next thing in 72. And there's a couple series out there from uh, Crawford probably has the largest series in 2003, uh, when Osdemir in 2018, which is more recent. And they're still relatively small, 12 patients and eight patients, all you know, within a day and a half or a week of birth. So these kids are you know, really small. The Crawford series, they actually often repaired the myelo at the same time as they did the, the kyphectomy. On average, you know, almost three levels removed. And similarly, they put a suture in the front, you know, they took the VCR out, they packed bone in, sutured the end plates together, uh, and sometimes cast the kids if you needed to. They listed uh, primarily two complications in a series of 12. So one re to nine years, which is probably still a win as you can intervene nine years later with a you know, smaller surgery, less deformity, you have to correct at that point. And one patient had persistent ulcerations over the kyph itself. They also listed uh, several strain complications, a femur fracture and restricted lung disease. But again, it's hard to tie these directly to the surgery. And then Ozdemir, had a small series more recently where they used four VCR techniques and four decancellation techniques. They actually had a death in the series. And again, related to you know, perioperative blood loss, which can be significant in these children. Uh, good correction overall, and overall you know, not too many complications aside from a dramatic one. Uh, and the question is, what about kids that are in between? So maybe they're not neonates, but you're doing it a little bit later and they have a lot of growth to do. So we've learned this from the formative literature. We don't fuse them. And the old adage was, short and straight is better than long and crooked. And so we would fuse children with early onset scoliosis, fusing them short, but then they would be found to basically restricting their lung development and they get restrictive lung disease. Uh, and so now we have growing devices in where you allow growth and you can kind of expand and you know, either manually or you know, magnetically expand to allow them to grow. There's not much in terms of kyph. There's one series, uh, this OSCAN group published actually relatively recently, improving uh, kyphosis tremendously, you know, almost unbelievably, about 115 degrees to four degrees. I resected two vertebrae, a reasonable blood, uh, time of blood loss and EDL, and they showed growth across those few segments. They left a lot of the set screws loose. They didn't fuse the whole segment like the image on the right. They fused the apex of the top and the bottom where they did the kyph, and then they basically left set screws loose. Uh, whether they develop autofusion is a separate uh, question, but they showed some degree of growth per year over time. Similarly, they also had, you know, two thirds of the patients had complications, which is, again, represented well in the literature. Uh, 
which is pretty common. And then there's one case report of actually of a man, uh, basically of a another growing device, sorry, which is a more standard magne uh, not magnetic, sorry, the standard growing rod. So they placed, uh, they fused the bottom and then basically placed a growing rod that you can distract serially across this patient. You know, th is there a role for the newer advent of the magnetic growing rod? Maybe, you know, these rods, you wouldn't have to actually uh, reoperate and lengthen every few months. I think for the right child, the right age, that might be a good option. Uh, this is a case that uh, I did previously. So a child, a 10 year old child with, uh, you know, gibbous, which is the deformity in the back, significant kind of, Siphonic kyph right there. Ultimately, this is a depiction of it, which is probably not super accurate, but it's a decancellation procedure and closing down on that with a fusion across it. Uh, thankfully, you didn't have to extend high into the thoracic spine, but the more you extend there, the more I worry that uh, in a young child, you could restrict their lung development. Uh, with good outcomes at two years, doing well, that improves sitting balance. We did review the literature uh, previously, and I had published this, but at the time there was 31 retrospective series. You know, the correction people achieve is good, about 71% correction overall, uh, you know, with a good follow-up in the literature as well, close to four years plus, but there is a significant portion of patients that lose a bit of correction over time, about 22%. Uh, and some of that may be to some of the older techniques of wiring and, and that may be improved now with pedicle screws and better fixation. But overall there's a high complication rate. So about 83 to 100% of series reported complications Primarily, as you expect, wound healing, infections, and that represented 63 to almost 80% of those patients. And then everything else could develop, you know, medical issues, infection related, instrumentation problems, and proximal loss of fixation, kyphosis, and then like we talked about VP shunt malfunction and problems like that that may not always be related to that. Now, and these are some kind of summarized in the literature. And this is a kid that I'm actually now I came into clinic last week, but we saw him before uh, the, the early x-rays, but when they were a year old, which is a pretty mild deformity. Uh, and then uh, basically we saw him about two years of age and it was like this, it had progressed. And, you know, I, was, I basically debated whether to intervene or should we watch the child? The child was four at that point. Uh, and we kept on watching it thinking that, you know, how, like what could happen, how could it progress over time? And it has gone worse. And this is on the right recently. So this kid is now getting worked up for surgery and you know, we'll have to do a kyphectomy and a fusion uh, in that patient. Uh, so obviously, you know, in summary, these are these cases that have high complication or associated with them. You can try to mitigate it a little bit. And some of the tools we use in neuromuscular scoliosis that can apply to this are intra wound antibiotics that might help. Obviously plastic surgery involvement for the skin closure and flaps to help with this even using a skin vac over the, over the surface to try to one, prevent stool to get into the wound and also to try to help promote uh, vascular, vascularization of the wound. Uh, but there's a lot we don't know about these patients, meaning the surgery truly helped them. We don't know. You got a, for every patient, we have to balance the risk and benefit, obviously. So what's the risk of putting through this and the benefit they may gain from it? And then what exactly is the best technique and timing still remain unanswered. I think next, Mari is going to give a talk. And so uh, if you guys know Mari, you know that Mari really hasn't grown a whole lot since like fifth grade. And so if she's giving a talk on shortening osteotomy, I think there's merit to, to this technique. So I'll leave it to Mari next. Oh, thanks, Steve. <laughs> um, all right, give me just a sec to share these slides. All right, I hope everyone can see this okay. Um, so thanks, Steve. It's, it's a hard act to follow, I'll be honest. Um, Steve has been a mentor and a friend of mine for many years. And so um, actually some of the work that I'll talk about today is actually from him as well. Um, and I think when you think of spinal deformity or spinal fusions, um, within the context of pediatric neurosurgery, it can really mean a lot of different things. And so what I wanted to do is really highlight, I think, the historical nature of this diagnosis in terms of tethered cord. The fact that there have been a lot of changes over the years that I think really also mirror our changes within the Pete spinal uh, deformity community as well, and kind of taking an old technique that was de designed for something else and applying it to a novel problem um, without a lot of you know historically good treatment options. Um, and I think that's because tethered cord as a diagnosis can be confusing, right? Steve mentioned some of those studies that were coming out of China. And when I look at a lot of the orthopedic literature that are looking at tethering or tethered cord in general, you know, I think it's important to remember that not all etiologies are the same. 
And I think too, it's hard because not all radiographs um, indicate a patient who is otherwise symptomatic. Um, you know, just because you have a neural plaque code and you release it, the spinal cord is going to remain low. So is that a patient that necessarily is tethered or will require intervention? You know, I think that the natural history of that is a little bit um, debatable. And again, it's because when we talk about spina bifida occulta as a diagnosis, it's really a large wastebasket term, right? For congenital lesions that can occur really early during development, but essentially can mean anything from a fatty phylum to a lipomyelin acyl. And I would argue that the two diagnoses are really um, incongruous, even though, you know, at the end result, you know, you can have ongoing neurological progression due to a typical type of uh, neuropathology, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. Um, you know, when we think of spina bifida, it's really been described for many millennia, right? Hippocrates, Aristotle, both described patients with myelomeningocele and even advocated for infanticide because there were really no good treatment options available at that time. The term itself was first coined during the Dutch medical revolution um, with Nicholas Tulip, and then one of his colleagues kind of described his first series of 10 patients where essentially everyone died because there was no um, antisepsis available. Um, and so fast forward about 200 years, you had both uh, physicians out of Germany and then also Charles Frazier here in the U.S. who were advocating and kind of describing uh, neuronal closure techniques that mirror, I think, very similar our own closure techniques today. You know, he was talking about essentially um, a myodural uh, fascial flap that was used to kind of then uh, prevent the egress of CSF. But at the turn of the century, even though we did have some early antisepsis available at the time, really treatment for hydrocephalus was not available. And so I think the overall life expectancy for a lot of these infants was really poor. And it wasn't until the invention, the invention of the shunt in the 60s and 70s where it became a little bit more ubiquitous. And then we were starting to see the life expectancy of these infants and children kind of develop. And so I think as a diagnosis, really tethering and tethered cord came about in large part due to the group from Toronto kind of describing their own case series and natural history for tethering and describing it as a pathophysiology. Um, but even as recently as 1987, which is really not that long ago, um, you know, we were still just, you know, debating as to whether or not it was a true entity or a true diagnosis. And then even within this century, right, in 2004 at our PEAT section, you know, there was a debate as to whether or not, um, you know, surgery would be indicated for certain patients. And if you look, I think there's a lot of discrepancy, and I would argue there's still a lot of discrepancy of how we would treat these patients. Um, it becomes a little bit more easy to say, well, you know, a patient who's presenting with urological symptoms or maybe a little bit of motor deficit, if they have both a fatty phylum or a radiographic finding as well as a low cord, those patients, I think you can more easily kind of recommend surgery. For those patients with relatively normal imaging, kind of there's a wide disparity of what different people would recommend. Um, and I'm sure people on the panel today can comment as well, you know, whether or not that discrepancy still exists. In large part, I think it's because again, we consider tethered cord to be a pediatric disease. Historically, it was described in patients with the myelomeningocele who during times of peak growth were developing symptoms. But a lot of the adult literature and the literature that we take really have come about or have been referenced back to the pediatric literature. When in fact, if you look at a, a nationwide uh, inpatient sample that was uh, reported in 2007, looking at literature of the previous decade, up to a, almost a third of patients were presenting in their adult years. And the rate of complication and the rate of issues that these patients were developing were certainly higher the older they were getting. Now, why does a congenital lesion continue to cause problems for patients throughout the course of their life? Um, you know, again, uh, tethered cord and, and uh, spina bifida in and of itself is something that occurs really early during development, even before women typically know that they're pregnant. Um, and yet it can cause problems well into adulthood. Well, Yamada first described this really in the 1980s using a series of different procedures and, and studies looking at the loss of distal elasticity within the spinal cord and the phylum and went on to kind of describe this almost in an ischemic standard uh, and fashion, mainly from the standpoint that the CNS really requires ATP um, used through oxidative metabolism in order to run all of its processes, right? So if this is compromised in any way, it can cause problems in the long run. The spinal cord behaves a little bit like a tension spring in the sense that with flexion and extension, you can see movement and changes within the overall diameter, as well as the length of the spinal cord up to 7%. Um, over time, this compressive effect can occur and kind of accumulate, so mimicking ischemia in the sense that 
If you have a really big insult, of course, you can have permanent ischemia, but with re repetition, there can be slight little um, penumbras that can develop over time that can lead to hypoxia and then eventually to demyelination. And that's mimicked and kind of represented as well with this underlying metabolic derangement in the sense that really how much um, energy does the cells do the cells require in order to fire appropriately. So we showed this in both a cat model as well as a cadaveric human model um, under traction, showing that with tethering or with traction, we saw decrement in both ANG firing and MEP firing, and that with release of that, we saw some improvement, albeit not quite back to baseline, and that these symptoms could then recur and have an increased latency in terms of firing effects um, when retethered again or placed under traction again. So really when thinking about this problem globally, well, cells need energy, right, to function and survive. Stretching the spinal cord can mimic this kind of penumbra and mild hypoxemia, and that over time it can impair neuronal firing. And eventually with time, and this is really the key because the timing of this is really unknown, with prolonged ischemia, these symptoms can become permanent. And so the ideal treatment for these patients, right, is not to do something necessarily when there aren't that many issues, but to try to intervene or do something prior to these symptoms becoming permanent. And that transition point, I think, is really difficult to know. Now, clinically, these patients will typically um, present with a triad of symptoms, including pain, motor dysfunction, or sensory dysfunction. I think it's really hard to identify patients or who come to you with, with just pain, right? Because 30, 40, 50 year old patients, myself included, can have pain for a lot of different degenerative reasons that are probably unrelated to their congenital finding. Um, and so in general, I try to say that tethered cord for me is a clinical diagnosis, and I really need multiple different symptoms that weigh in and kind of uh, come into this. I think it's also important to remember that children are not going to present similar to adults, right? In the sense that, you know, my toddler is not going to come to me and say, you know, I really noticed that on the bottom of my foot, I had a little bit of numbness. It's a little bit worse now than it was over the holidays. And I find that when I run up the ramp, I can't do it quite as well. I mean, my five-year-old can't even tell me what he ate for lunch or what class he went to. So I think from a pediatric perspective, you really have to include parents in on this discussion and kind of um, alert them to the fact that, you know, you want to monitor symptoms over a period of time. I think adolescents are also another challenging group to follow. And while they're notoriously difficult uh, historians for other reasons, they're more likely to present a typical adult triad. So in general, right, pain, maybe changes with their AFOs or changing in their gait, um, sensory dysfunction that can occur repetitively with motion, similar to claudication, um, but that can progress with time or with other activities such as flexion extension, are really kind of the symptoms that you're looking for. Whereas in the younger pediatric population, you might say, you know, they're presenting with symptoms that could be consistent with either like a shunt malfunction, for example, which always has to be taken into consideration, um, or other like swelling or issues with the, with the um, defect itself primarily. Um, and then although tethering is an insidious process, often these patients can present in a more acute fashion. So we have all had patients who maybe has been, uh, you know, in an accident or some sort of trauma or who had an excessive flexion motion, who then, you know, after that started to develop some symptoms. Um, and these are things that you do want to kind of take into consideration, especially if you're trying to counsel patients appropriately. Um, because really when you're talking about treatment strategies, I think there's always this arm as to whether or not to observe versus intervene. And again, that transition point between intermittent symptoms that are not progressing to then more progressive symptoms that are becoming permanent is really the, the pinpoint area that you wanna to try to strategize. And in fact, patients who may present with a fatty phylum incidentally, but who have a very active lifestyle, you might counsel that patient very differently than a patient who is you know, 60 or 70 years old with a split cord malformation. Um, now, some intradural and tetherings, I think, are a little bit more easy to uh, consider doing surgery for, you know, especially if you have a dermal sinus tract, which is relatively straightforward and I think has a high incidence of tethering or causing problems uh, over the long haul. A fatty phylum, again, in a patient where there are very kind of uh, questionable symptoms will always be difficult to rule out, and it's a relatively straightforward and low complicated procedure. So in those particular instances, I think it's reasonable to consider surgery. But not all pathologies are the same, right? And your index procedure is really your first and best opportunity to get as complete an untethering as possible, which is really the most important thing in my mind for recurrent symptoms or recurrent tethering that patients can develop. And I would argue that a patient with a complex lipomyelomeningocele that has significant neural structures running through it 
it's going to be very different, right? Those patients are really like a wad of chewing gum stuck in your hair, and you will never be able to tease out all of that fat, nor would it be appropriate, because I think um, the issues with thermal injury and other neuropathic pain that can result from that are pretty high. Um, but yeah, these are patients that go on to have significant issues in the long run. And so how are we trying to think of them from a global standpoint in terms of managing their symptoms and the potential natural history for that? And again, I think the risk of recurrence is high in those patients that you're unable to get a complete untethering in. Um, and the complication rate is also higher each sub uh, subsequent time that you go in. Um, and at least in my own training, you know, I trained at a place where uh, you know, recurrent tethering and recurrent tethering surgeries were really common because these patients would come in and say, you know, I had such great relief and all of my symptoms got better. Uh, but now, you know, I'm having the same symptoms now just two years after the fact. And so we would go in time and time again. And each time subsequently, it got harder and harder um, to the point where you're stimulating and you have no idea what's nerve or what's scar tissue. Right. So I think that it's really important that when we're sitting in that moment and we're not quite sure if what we're doing is really in the best interest of the patient, but clearly it's doing something or maybe having some benefit or they're having progressive symptoms that are really hard to sit on. We have to start thinking globally outside of the box in terms of what else we can offer. And so Cocobone was the one that really thought of this in the 1990s, saying that if the pathology is due to stretch, there are really two ways that we can address this. Right. Either we take the spinal cord down below and we release it so that then it's under less tension, or we take two points and we move it together. And both will arguably, I think, release the tension on the spinal cord and the, the nervous tissue in a similar way. And so again, we're talking about a pathology that really affects the lower part of the spine. Why would it have any effect if we did something kind of elsewhere in the spine? Um, and I think when we start thinking about spinal shortening, there are a lot of different ways to cut it. There are a lot of different uh, methods that have been recorded in the literature. Um, but in general, the method that, you know, I think Steve here has championed and that, you know, I've adopted into my own practice as well is um, trying to take an area in a relatively uh, sagittally neutral area of the spine. Um, because when we think about goals of this procedure, right, the goals are, well, we need to take off some tension. So where exactly are we going to do that? And how are we going to do that through different osteotomies? Um, and then also we want to make sure that we get arthrodesis because oftentimes too, these patients are very young. And so it's important that they have fusion. And we want to minimize issues and problems both above and below our construct because from a long-term perspective, it's really important that we maintain good overall spinal health. Um, so when thinking of osteotomies, right, from a spinal deformity standpoint, there are lots of different tools in our arsenals that we can use, either posterior elements, anterior elements, 360, are we doing a full VCR, are we doing something a little bit less? Um, and so Steve actually looked at this from a cadaveric standpoint, saying, you know, how much bone is really um, the optimal amount to take? And what he was able to find is that by reducing the vertebral column by about 20 to 25 millimeters was really that sweet spot where we got a comparable release of tension to that of releasing 90% of the neural elements. Just meaning that the pull of the spinal cord at that particular level and reducing that much bone um, was comparable to then cutting about 90% of the nerve roots or the spinal cord down below. Um, and so when you think of these recurrent untethering procedures, right, the likelihood that you're going to be able to cut 90% of the scar, I think, goes down pretty significantly. So that's a really, like, durable and large number. At the same point, you want to make sure that we're not causing any additional injury, right? And so safety is really important. How can we make sure that we're not translating the spinal column? How can we make sure we're not putting any new pressure on the spinal cord itself? And so we looked at dural buckling kind of as an adjunct of that. Um, we'll see a surgical video here in just a moment, but I wanted to run through some of the global steps so that you have an idea before we get into that. And essentially, we're looking at both um, a laminectomy, which is really important. Um, a wide laminectomy, I think, also really helps make sure that you don't have dural buckling, both above and below. Again, when we talk about osteotomies or how much bone to take, in general, we found that really by doing um, a coronally balanced kind of PSO or a pedicle subtraction osteotomy, as well as a disc space above, that you typically will give us enough space. Um, and that's also something as well that you know, we're able to measure and look at kind of on our preoperative um, x-rays and uh, imaging as well. And then again, through a series of kind of uh, sequential compression, a little bit different than here, um, you know, we're able to compress down and make that space significantly smaller. Um, and again, from an arthrodesis standpoint, it's really important that we have bone-on-bone -bone contact so that we can maintain kind of that arthrodesis in the long run.
back to the original goals, again, this is an area of the spine or this is a spinal procedure where unlike a deformity surgery where we're trying to correct a large pythectomy, for example, we're really not trying to change these patients overall sagittal alignment, um, which they have compensated for very well and often don't have any issues. I think long-term issues with spinal constructs could be higher, especially if we are changing some of that. And so the thoracolumbar junction in general is an area that's relatively sagittally neutral that um, works fairly well for this. And it also affects less of the motion segments down in the lumbar spine for these patients. So in this surgical video, you know, we first start with our instrumentation. Instrumentation is very personal. You can do it any way you want. Um, in this particular instance, they're doing some navigation, but you can certainly arm, spin, nav, the whole cadre. But um, the other difference that I just like to point out as well is that is in this particular video, um, you know, we're using both a, a one above and one below construct. And I think there have been a higher number of kind of issues in terms of uh, construct failures with this. And so um, in general, I, I've moved to both a two above, two below construct, but I'll be interested to hear if Steve has, has done anything differently. Um, you're seeing the bone scalpel here, which we love as a tool. It really, I think, helps maintain um, good uh, uh, hemostasis during the resection. I love how it is really precise in terms of its cuts. Um, the bottom of the blade theoretically doesn't impact or cut dura as well, which is really nice. Um, it certainly can heat up and, um, you know, if the irrigation isn't running as well, I think there can be issues with that. But in general, we've really uh, liked it as a tool, both from the linear cut standpoint, as you're seeing here in the posterior elements, to now kind of moving towards the lateral elements and then anteriorly to the spine. Now, once the laminectomy is off, this is a little early for me, but in general, you have to do both a rib uh, resection or at least a rib dearticulation. Without that, you're not freeing up your lateral elements to allow the spine to compress normally on, uh, down on itself. Um, but then you have to start working on removing the posterior lateral elements as well as then anteriorly to the spine. The last component will be the epidural component, you know, right in front of the spinal cord itself. And so I do actually love using the bone scalpel for this as well. I think, you know, and some people feel like it may be a little bit slower, but um, it's a self irrigating kind of hemostatic way to really work your way down along the cortical surface of the bone anteriorly. Um, and then kind of completing your bony work from that standpoint. Um, there are lots of different ways to do this. In general, it's just important to remember that you have a temporary rod in place once you start uh, getting relatively free um, at some point here as well. Usually after I do uh, one of my uh, fast techniques, I'll want to try to get into the disc space to just kind of peel off the disc there um, to allow good arthrodesis of that inferior implant at the level above. Um, and then you're seeing ultrasound here as well. There was a recent pub, uh, paper actually published out of China looking at the ultrasound as a method of looking at kinking within the spinal cord. For us, we're trying to develop other ways to use ultrasound in real time to um, help guide kind of uh, the shortening process as well. And then once all of that is done, once you've kind of gone to the anterior um, ligamentous uh, level, you don't necessarily have to go through the entire part, the anterior spine. But I do find that at least it has to be pretty thin in order to kind of crack this area down. Um, and then through a sequential kind of compression technique bilaterally, um, ensuring that you're not translocating the spinal column in general, um, you'll want to compress down um, following your monitoring the, the time that you're doing that. Um, and so then at the end, you have a spinal cord that looks relatively healthy. You have bone on bone contact. And again, usually you've um, taken off enough bony products to make sure that you have good arthrodesis throughout as well. So there's definitely some emerging literature showing that this technique seems to work. And in general, there's a lot of variability both in the technique that's used and also the etiologies. There's also a lot of heterogeneity in looking at the symptom duration prior to surgery, as well as the age groups um, throughout. But in general, um, you know, spinal shortening has been used for both an index surgery as well as a retethering surgery. Um, although I make an argument that if you haven't had an index surgery or a traditional intradural spinal and tethering procedure, that at least in my mind, I'm not sure I would recommend that as an upfront procedure yet. Um, in general, motor function had the highest rate of improvement. Sensory function had the lowest. There was some mix in terms of sphincter dysfunction as well, but I think that also has to do with the types of uh, uh, duration of symptoms leading up to, to, to surgery. The other thing I just wanted to mention is that sequential shortening has also been described. And again, if your goal is to get about 20 to 25 millimeters, are there other ways to do that? Sure. I think there are. And again, you could certainly do kind of these posterior osteotomies and then sequentially compress down um, in a posterior only fashion. I worry a little bit about 
fusing within the lumbar spine primarily, mainly too because these patients might rely on um, the mobility and flexibility in that area in order to accomplish um, good ADLs as well as uh, toilet hygiene and other things. And so by removing that, I do worry a little bit about kind of long-term progressive issues and then also the durability of that construct in the long run as well. So in our own series here, um, both here and at Barrow uh, with Nick Theodore, we were able to look at 20 patients total, looking primarily at lipomyelomeningocele patients, because again, we felt this was a really high risk population to have um, a poor total untethering at their index procedure, as well as issues with retethering procedures. Um, in general, the majority of our patients had maybe one to two median procedures leading up to surgery with about a year of symptoms leading, uh, coming into surgery as well. We were able to achieve kind of our overall height reduction that we um, you know, had proposed. And again, I think ultrasound can be a really powerful intradural, I'm sorry, intraoperative tool. You know, this is looking kind of intradurally at the spinal cord prior to um, the shortening procedure. And you can see even remotely um, from this patient's procedure, there's a lot of arachnoiditis and scarring within the dural sac um, that you can see. Um, but following the procedure and following the shortening, there's increased CSF pulsation, there's more laxity, the dental ligaments look um, more relaxed. So in general, overall, the spinal cord has a little bit of a healthier appearance, even though there's really no good baseline for what we would expect to see in these patients. Now, neurological outcomes are comparable across the board with some improvement, either improvement or stability. There was one patient that had um, some neuro neuropathic pain postoperatively, but that did improve about a year after surgery. I think that mimics kind of their overall quality of life scores that we got as well, showing that there was global improvement for our patients. And the complications are relatively straightforward in terms of overall spinal deformity procedures. Um, and more importantly, I think that we were able to show at least in our series in comparison to not only prior um, spinal shortening procedures, but also traditionally detethering procedures that you know our goals or our outcomes are overall like roughly in line. So I think it's emerging as an attractive alternative, but I would make an argument that I think, you know, as, as pediatric neurosurgeons or as neurosurgeons in general, we really want to police this, um, you know, a little bit, uh, a little bit more tightly, right? This is probably not your procedure for a patient with a fatty phylum who has some very mild symptoms, who's otherwise pretty healthy and has never had an untethering procedure previously. Um, Conversely as well, I have some pause about patients who have really tremendous arachnoiditis or um, a lot of scarring, uh, specifically in their lumbar area, because, um, and Steve and I have actually talked about this this week, you know, I'm not sure if the constriction around the nerve roots, especially in the lumbar area, is going to mimic kind of the pathophysiology that we're thinking in terms of overall spinal untethering. Um, and so I think the jury is out a little bit on these outlier cases that are still really difficult to treat. Um, but as a whole, for patients who have had a previous procedure, who may have even had an untethering procedure with some improvement, I think it really could potentially be the next step for treating patients that historically have been really hard to treat. And so with that, I'll finish. And I think we're a little bit early, but this will probably give us a good opportunity to talk and have some questions from the group. Those were both really fantastic talks. Thank you so much to both of you. Um, so hopefully now our panelists will jump in with questions and then any of our um, participants, uh, you can ask questions on the chat function as well. Uh, so please uh, add your questions in as well and we'll pose them. Mari, I have a question for you. Um, what do you recommend for someone that's, um, let's say has had an index untethering for lipomyelomeningocele and then is, uh, let's say the age of 10, 11, 12, or let's just say 12 to 14 for the purpose of this discussion. Um, when would, what is the youngest age you would consider a spinal shortening procedure? So, I mean, it's been done in kids as young as eight. I have a little bit of pause, like you mentioned in kids who are skeletally immature to consider, you know, a shortening procedure, but I think it really just depends on their symptoms and presentation at that time. You know, if they're really having like malignant decline and previously, um, you know, they've had some improvement. You can always talk to patients or parents about going in and doing kind of a traditional uh, intradural untethering versus something a little bit more controversial and less described. And I know, Steve, what do you think? I, I agree. I think it's, I don't think there's a clear cut right answer that, and, you know, it's like you summarized the early literature, they did, you know, after the third or fourth detethering. So it was a little more conservative. And I think things are pushed a little bit towards the other spectrum where people may be doing after one, so you know, the first or second detethering. But I do think there's 
a balance, like where the right spot is, is probably somewhere in between. You know, I think for me, it's certainly a child who's high functioning with a complex, uh, a complex anatomy, it, it pushes it up a little bit more as a more likely option, or at least in my hands, a more comfortable option. Uh, but I don't know, I'm curious to hear what everybody else has in terms of their threshold of intervention. And if, you know, it changes depending on anatomy or what factors. Yeah, finding that sweet spot in terms of where the risk benefit ratio lies in terms of the number of operations for an intradural versus the longer term complications of, you know, reducing motion segments and adjacent level instability in the lumbar spine, I think you will only find out with time. Um, you know, Maureen, see, one of the questions I have is from your guys' experience, how often, if, if ever, have you seen signal changes during the shortening procedure uh, in these patients? And has that changed your influence the procedure in any way? Or have a lot of the patients you've done it on been like myelopatients patients or something that haven't had signals at baseline, so it's, it's not really relevant? Or what's your as this experience been with that? We've been pretty lucky. We haven't had any signal changes yet, although hopefully you didn't just jinx us. <laughs> But, um, Maybe I'm but, the only one that gets signal changes in the OR. I, I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, again, I think it's it's a really important question, right? You know, in terms of trying to pick the best patient for this procedure. And I would argue that patients who are already neurologically tenuous, who maybe have a really um, complicated, like Steve mentioned, intradural anatomy with really bad arachnoiditis. I am just a little hesitant to recommend this as a procedure that I think will give them a lot of durability and, and, and symptom improvement in the long run, which at the end of the day is my goal for them. Um, so I don't know, but it's a good question. Yeah, so I mean, I, I've had many signal changes not related to this, but- <laughs> Thank you, Steve, thank you. Makes <laughs> <laughs> me feel better. Well, obviously. <laughs> I'm turning off the autonomy I haven't, at any yet, knock on wood. Uh, and I think it's overall, the cord is not as tenuous. I think we're not operating right around it. It's not compressed against the pedicle or something. So I think it's a little safer in many ways for that. I often, in patients who are myelopathic or, or tenuous to start, I'll often ask and are monitoring how is the you know, beginning, their baseline, and how is it after? You know, usually it's the same. Once in a blue moon, they say it's a little improved, which I, I always hope for, but I don't really expect. <laughs> I think it's them humoring more than really like a change happening. Uh, but from shortening osteotomies, I think overall it's pretty safe because it's not a ton. As long as it doesn't sublux and the cord doesn't shift, overall, I think the risk is relatively low. I think the only time I've, and whether it's dural buckling or, you know, I've had one patient that, uh, not from a shortening osteotomy, but from a VCR from a achondroplasia patient, with significant thoracolumbar kyphosis, just it happened twice. We closed the patient down, and just when we were closing the muscle, the motor dropped out. And you know, we went back in. The dura looked a little compressed, so we released some of it. Took less correction. We you know sat around for a while. It got better. Similarly, kind of went through it again. The patient actually, I think, had a slightly delayed effect where they actually woke up. The monitoring improved, but they woke up with a deficit. So we took them back and just took the cage out, and they recovered. I think that's a different population. I mean, Mari has a, a lot of experience with achondroplasia patients, obviously. <laughs> you could weigh in on that. I don't want to talk about my signal changes there. <laughs> um, but I think those patients have a lot of sequential compression elsewhere in the spine. And what I found in those patients as well, too, is that, you know, it's such a high EVL surgery that by the time you get around to your deformity correction, you're probably already behind uh, from an anesthesia standpoint. And then you add the additional stress of a correction on top of that. You know, I think that a lot of these kids just can't tolerate it. Um, and we probably underappreciate, I think, their degree of stenosis elsewhere in the spine. The, in terms of corrective mechanics, um, A, with deformity and without deformity, how are you guys addressing that um, in patients that you're shortening? So for my shortening patients, I don't have a lot of you know, pre-op deformity. So again, the goal is really just to maintain their overall alignment, which makes my job a lot easier right, than um, other traditional spinal deformity corrections. Yeah, similarly, I think most of mine have not had any deformity with it. And so you yeah, usually try to put it at the thoracolumbar junction. So when it avoids the prior myelo, you know, closure and the skin issues, the wound issues, and it normally in an ambulatory patient should be a fairly straight or slightly mildly kyphotic segment. So then you don't have to worry about the rods too much. And like Mari talked about, I, I, I've done one in one, one above, one below. But one of my patients fell and broke the bottom pedicle and everything. So I generally go to two and two now. Um, 
Mm -hmm. are, are you are you compressing simultaneously side to side or are you you know once you once you've done your corpectomy and you have an empty space how are you going about shortening that so you're doing that in a safe and effective way yes yeah, so i've done it uh, there's two i there's some of the instrumentation companies i don't want to name any that have a little device that you can close and basically twist and it closes it down so i've used that uh, or sometimes here, both rods, I'll use two compressors here and have hands and kind of close both sides slowly and just watch it. Mari? Yeah. yeah, and I think in general, too, you know, depending on how aggressively you've taken your bone, there's still some give there. So you have a bit more control and it's not quite as loose as a traditional VCR. We have a um, question from one of the um, from from the audience about, are you routinely placing spoon retractors ventral to the vertebral column to ensure the anterior cortex is removed in preparation for shortening? Yeah, so I don't typically do that. I actually prefer to avoid going anterior because I think potentially you hit the segmental, the order, the branches. So I actually prefer to go outside lateral and use the, like Mari talked about and showed in the video, the Masonic's round burr. I, I think you lose some of the bones. So if you're trying to save the bone for graft, you lose a little bit of it. But to me, the blood loss is less, it's very controlled. Uh, and I just burr that down until it's soft. And then basically you leave it, you have the ALL very anteriorly to protect you. And so that I, you know, you're hopefully not violating anteriorly for that. And if you're trying to do like a PSO, the one technique is the burr is kind of wide. So if you use that, then the anterior column shortening is too much, so you lose deformity correction. So in that case, I'll just use like a one or two kerosene just to bite across a little segment. So then you can try to angulate it better. Yeah, same. So one of the questions I have for you guys, I have a kid right now who, um, he's, a, he's a kid from South America, uh, bad Milo, and has a pretty significant kyphotic deformity. Um, and he's a complex kid, um, doesn't have an ulcer there, uh, but has a barrel shaped chest doesn't necessarily, um, he's seven years old, so he's not really kind of at the point where um, we're having really any issues with him, but the main issue is that he's, um, he just looks really uncomfortable, right? He can't have a comfortable seat. And the question that I have for you guys is when you have a kid like that, uh, given what you know about the complications with kyphectomy, what do you think the best option is for these kids? Yeah, I wish I had the answer for you. <laughs> I don't know what the right answer is, to be honest. I'd love to see what the panelists think as well. Uh, I, I, I think it's a struggle a little bit. Like the kid I showed, you know, I thought he, you know, it was like 130, 140 degrees of kyphosis. I imagine how much worse could it get, right? And you got worse. <laughs> I was wrong. Like, and I think in doing so, he gets more thoracic lordosis, which is also a bad thing. And I, I presume that's going to affect his pulmonary function, make that worse as well. So that kid, were, and that kid was comfortable. He initially had a bit of an ulcer there. We had plastic see him and it healed up. So that was my initial threshold to operate. If that didn't get better, I was gonna operate for the ulcer to close it. And he has no pain. He doesn't complain of anything. But I, I just imagine that you know, he's, he's, where he's sitting is probably on his femurs more than his you know, actual uh, you know, ischium anymore. And that's probably just gonna progress over time. So that's why I'm kind of pulling the trigger on that child now. You know, whether I do it a little later or early, it probably is complication fraud anyways. So I don't think it's better. I think I will try not to go high in the thoracic spine if I can avoid it. So we can hopefully grow and really, you know, won't compromise the pulmonary function. But I don't really know what the right answer is necessarily. I don't know what you guys think. In, in our practice or in my practice, I tend to be relatively conservative until I can't, right? So, uh, um, and the same idea is, is, is going... Um, I'll do everything that I can to stay in the lower thoracic um, to preserve a lot of that growth. Um, the issue sometimes becomes, and this is, you know, when you're taking multiple segments, um, the egg shelling of it, by the time you're done kind of taking everything down, you still end up with a sizable gap. So um, there are times where regardless of how I take it, because I do it the same way, Steve does is like, I try to stay away from the spoon retractors and going really anterior. But even then when you're done with it, you end up with a pretty sizable uh, defect. And so oftentimes I will use like a, a titanium mesh or a harms cage to, to, to fill that. And I've even done um, things like a, um, a 
like a uh, femoral struts or uh, to fill that space as well. But I think you just, I think basically it's one of those things where the best answer I've found, and this is anecdotal and there's no evidence to it, is you wait as long as you can and then you can't wait and then you do it because you're going to be in, you're going to be in trouble no matter what happens. So that's the way I look. You're working hard no matter what. So. Steve, I agree with you too. I think that that I think the long term history of that is is really unsustainable, um, and I think that one thing to consider is the longer you wait, the more poor the soft tissue coverage becomes, and that I think you're much more likely to get into wound significant wound healing issues, and um, and and problems with that. Um, so there are situations where my threshold, even if there's been only moderate progression, is if I see the that the skin is getting thinner and thinner. Um, when you feel all the little ridges of the bone, um, I, I, and, uh, I think it's time. Um, one question I had, I, I want to hear Jen's comments about that case too, but the, the, uh, and, and Maurice, but the, uh, another question I wanted to throw in for the whole group was, have you guys seen, or at least in my practice, when when I operate on a myelo at birth that has a kyphectomy, I will always do a kyphectomy or a gibbous deformity. I will always do a kyphectomy at birth. I wish I had a better way to fix those vertebral bodies than, than putting a couple of you know, proline sutures around the vertebral body above and below. Um, but at least from my experience so far, the incidence of major gibbous progression needing deformity surgery before the child reaches spinal maturity has been much lower with that. And I was wondering if that's been a similar feeling among the group. Like, is it, would you, you know, do you guys feel it's worth doing that at the time of myoclosure closure to try to delay the progression and not need growing contracts and that kind of stuff? Or what's your guys' experience been with that? I, so I personally haven't done any neonates. I think it's a reasonable contra based and certainly in the literature and how people have done with it. Uh, it, it seems like a very good result. Uh, so I would, I think it's reasonable to do something with, lower complication early and avoid having to do a higher risk complication later is certainly a good trade-off. Mm, I haven't, of the kids that I've closed and we're doing a lot of prenatal closure now, um, I haven't had a lot of kids with big uh, kyphoses at, at birth. So there's been a few kids that have had a little bit of uh, kyphosis, but um, I haven't seen any severe uh, uh, kids with kyphosis at birth. I don't know, Mari, have you? I've seen one kid um, that I've, I've done a kyphectomy on and um, so far, I mean, the kid's only six or so right now. So we haven't progressed, which is a good sign, but it's, um, you know, also stresses out our uh, anesthesiology colleagues when we're taking these neonates and, and doing a little bit of a kyphectomy as well. Um, so uh, we have, uh, you know, some concern there, but it's, that's a really, that would be great to look at long-term to see. I don't have a robust experience either, so I'm a little at a loss there. Mm -hmm. So one Excuse other me. question from uh, the audience was, can you, um, I don't you guys can see it, but if you'd ever uh, use the end endoscope to look to see if you have a good resec resection ventrally, I don't know if you guys use that. Um, I haven't used the endoscope for that purpose, but I use ultrasound to look at the um, posterior aspect of, of the vertebral bodies uh, to take a look at the cortex. Um, so that's, I, I sort of use the ultrasound not only for intradural evaluation, but also to look at the, um, my, uh, you know, anterior, anterior decompression. I use it once just for a video, just, <laughs> but not. <laughs> <laughs> you usually can feel it. It's like if you're through the cortical bone, you can palpate it. Like with a, like a pen fill four, if you want, you actually feel that the ALL is there. Yeah. I've, I've, I've been playing with it with my adult population. So I've got a couple of them where I put the scope in, but just for the sake of putting a scope in. <laughs> Steve, I got a, a question for you. You, you uh, raised, a, a, I think, a really important topic. Um, briefly in your talk about the, whether it's necessary to detether uh, before spinal deformity surgery. Um, and, um, you know, I, I agree with you completely. The jury's really 
still out on a lot of types of detethering. Um, the only comment or, or addition to that, you didn't have time to go into it in your talk, but the, uh, in terms of specifically myeloma meningocele patients, I'd be curious among the panel and, and the participants, if anybody is still routinely doing um, prophylactic detethering for children with a myeloma meningocele before instrumentation. Because um, a couple of years ago, we published the you know, a multi-center study with about eight centers looking at about 200 patients. And we divided into three groups with no detethering within three months and then concurrent. Um, and what we showed was that there's two to three times increased risk for surgical site infection, return to the OR, lead for blood transfusion and uh, length of stay issues if you do any detethering before instrumentation. And there was no change in a neurological condition of any of the patients. Um, so I was going to be curious among the group if anybody's still doing that at their centers or whether you guys feel there's still clinical equipoise for that or, or we've kind of answered that question. I think for the myelos shifted away. It sounds like nobody's doing it for the myelos. Well, I, I would say if they're symptomatic, right? I think if you're symptomatic and you're concerned that there are symptoms, you can pinpoint to like a tethering phenomenon. It's not unreasonable to consider. Oh yeah, the for study was completely for asymptomatic. Yeah. For asymptomatic, I don't know that there's a lot of untethering being done. I, I think that I think a lot of the questions that'll come up in now are so say you have a split cord malformation that's you know, it doesn't matter type one or type two and the patient's asymptomatic and they present with a scoli that has to be treated, then do you have to go? And I, I, my impression now is that we still tend to do it in North America, at least to release them. Uh, I know there's some data coming out from China and Turkey saying they don't have to, but you know, some of the China data is limited. They say, oh, do you just do it? They have the patients been on x-ray and they'll shoot for that much correction on the table. So they won't correct more than what they can do physically. But it's all hard to just, you know, to really gauge that interoperatively. They're under sedation, they're relaxed, the, you know, the muscles are you know, more relaxed. Are you going to inadvertently get more correction and cause a problem or what's the risk of that? I think, as long I, mean, as I think another part of that, and it's, it, this is hard to quantitate, is again, kind of returning to that, how you perform your corrective mechanics. Because if you do a lot of spinal lengthening, you're going to run into much more problems with your corrective mechanics than if you were doing it more of a shortened convex side uh, cantilever type of reduction where you're shortening the spine. So that some of that, I think, has to do with how you approach the the uh, the spine and what your end goals are. So if your end goals are to fuse in side two, you're probably not going to run into to as many issues. In the U.S., that's not usually what happens. We tend to be very aggressive in our corrections. So um, the mechanics and how we correct, I think, play a big role into what we see um, intraoperatively in terms of neuromodeling changes on these patients. And At least that that point historically, is, from what I see. Yeah, and I think that point is great. Meaning, if you're, especially the big curve, you're talking about. If you're starting to do VCR or shortening osteotomy or a hemi excision, you're shortening the spine, which essentially is what Mari's talked about. You're doing it kind of some kind of shortening osteotomy where you're releasing the tension on the cord. So in theory, that should be safer in addressing that issue. Yeah, I think it would be really hard if you have a split cord malformation, God forbid there is a complication and you didn't address that, right? Um, I think it would be really hard to kind of justify not going after um, that area, which I think opens up Pandora's box, right? Um, I do agree though um, with you, Rich, that you know doing anything with a Milo, I, I'm not sure you you add much um, to you know detethering at all. So, yeah, the uh, for 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 anybody who's interested, Doug Brockmeyer and I battled this out uh, for an ISPN webinar a few uh, about a month ago or so. Um, the um, one thing I would add to that is. You know, as we've talked a little bit, you know, signal changes in the OR during deformity correction surgery makes for a bad day. Um, and the, um, <laughs> you know, I do think that the chances for, you know, signal changes, you know, on a deformity correction, because as John said, we usually are aggressive. Um, you know, if you get signal changes during a case like that and you haven't done a primary detethering, it really puts you in a tough spot because you really don't know what to do. Um, and, and I personally have had a couple instances where it's clearly been from detethering because we've, you know, done a correction and then released a phylum and able to do the correction, you know, after that without changes. So I, I, I 
definitely think it exists. Has been and my one, one last thought about that. I think it also depends probably on the type of split cord malformation. I think if you have a large bony septum, I mean, obviously you're going to want to address that if it's more of a diplo, like a two, you know, two cords in a single dural sac without any obvious intradural uh, tethering or extradural bony septum, it might, you, you know, you might be able to get away without addressing primarily. Yeah, fair point. Can I ask, similar to your point, Rich, does anybody have a, a patient where they correct the deformity, no obvious tethered cord, so not like a fatty phylum or anything, but maybe a little low lying or something, kind of just, you know, nothing you'd be concerned about normally, but either intra-op with the deformity correction or post-op, something like you felt there was a change or they had some symptoms and releasing that actually helped them. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't want to monopolize the conversation, but yeah, so I've had two, I've, Steve, I've had two patients with, um, with Mike, one of them, which is a similar type of story where, um, you know, on preoperative assessment, the MRI showed maybe a fatty phylum, but, you know, a normal level conus or very slightly low lying, no neurologic symptoms, but progressive deformity. Um, and then took the kid in and either put him in traction, um, lost signals, took him out of traction, re-reviewed the MRI, went out and talked to the family, cut the phylum, put him in traction again with no loss of signals and did the case. Um, so that's, that's, that's the strongest evidence that I have, uh, but it's, you know, that's happened twice in, in, in my experience. And it's, it's very uncommon. I have one patient that was, it's interesting. She's an idiopathic, similar, the conus ends normal level, nothing super concerning, except for maybe, you know, the nerve roots sit dorsally. She actually went through a tethering or VBT procedure, had some paresthesias and some stuff post-op that I just couldn't quite explain. It resolved after like six weeks. So we kind of wrote it off. And unfortunately, she's one of the revision patients, went for a fusion, refused her, and then had the same symptoms again after, but they, they weren't going away. So it's still, I still, the jury's still out. I, I offered her to go snip the phylum, thinking it's the only thing I have left on the, you know, I can do. And she's biding her time right now. But I do wonder if that, you know, that could be the case. That's, yeah. Yeah. I think it exists. I have a question for the group a little bit more broadly about uh, deformity and myelomeningocele. With the um, increased numbers of prenatal closure, I know a lot of our centers are, are doing that now. Um, as a group, have you seen fewer or more patients conversely with spinal deformity with myelomeningocele? Do we think that prenatal closure is altering the you know, natural history of spinal deformity? I believe that prenatal closure increases the risk of tethering. Right. I would argue, in fact, that I think every patient that has a prenatal closure potentially is going to have like, you know, significant scarring and tethering as a result. Um, and I counsel patients as such as well. I do think that the benefits in terms of long term shunting and uh, high brain herniation are worthwhile, you know, for that concern. So I've been a little bit more aggressive in terms of recommending, uh, you know, relatively early untethering for patients, even with very subtle symptoms, for example. I think that if we weren't aggressive without untethering, I do worry that that potentially could lead to ongoing spinal deformity issues. And that'll be something that we have to watch a little bit more closely. Mm -hmm. I also think too, you know, with open closure versus um, fetoscopic closure, which is the more minimally invasive kind that we do at Hopkins, I worry a little bit about some of that bony architecture as well in terms of closure. You know, you're limited a little bit in terms of what you can do. And I know it's outside the scope of kind of this talk, but I wonder a little bit about how we're changing some of that bony anatomy based on the closure that we're doing. I wonder also, I've seen all, I don't, so I don't have, I don't do any fetal closure, but <laughs> I've seen a couple of patients with deformity who've had it done. And sometimes the skin is very thin over the dorsum, it's spread out. And I worry about the closure. We've had plastics involved and actually they put in tissue expanders to help. So when we close, there's more space. Have you guys seen that routinely or is it just, Coincidence that a few, the few patients I've seen have had that issue. It depends on the center they're coming from, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> None of them came from Hopkins. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I, there's something that we're changing about the architecture post posteriorly that I think is really important to acknowledge. I mean, a lot of the patients that we're seeing do heal actually very well, but there's probably 20 to 30% of the patients that we follow that have significant fibrosis um, and almost like an ossification really of that tissue back there. Um, and I think that can generally, when we change that as well, or if they have a really large lesion prenatally, 
um, that blood flow, uh, the blood supply is really compromised um, to the posterior element. So, and additionally with how we close, depending on what rotational muscle flaps we're trying to do at the time of fetal closure too, I think we're disrupting that, that blood flow and that blood supply even more. So I do worry about that. And I think that's a big concern, you know, kind of long-term data is gonna have to tease out a bit more. Um, but I also try to be upfront with my patients about that, you know, when talking to them about uh, fetal closure is that, you know, I do think that long-term spinal deformity is going to be an issue. I do think that tethering is gonna be an issue. Um, Mari, when you say that you're often pursuing earlier um, detethering on them, what age range are you seeing them retether in the prenatal closure ones? So again, it's complicated, it's right? variable, but Yeah, because they all come out and as part of our protocol, because we're still under FDA, um, uh, this FDA protocol, we're getting um, total scans at one year, a two year and three year. This is for the FDA. So as a result, you know, they're always going to like tether it again. They're always going to have this really kind of um, very fibrotic scar that that's back there. And I think, um, you know, I just counsel patients that I think if, you know, there's a concern that maybe the syrinx is getting a little bit worse, or if there's a new syrinx, if there's some question that they're not making progress with PT, which is a very soft call, um, you know, I'll talk to families about potentially detethering at that point. And what, what percentage are you seeing needing detethering? Probably about 20 or 30 percent. And what's your indication to detether, um, Mari? Like, what, what are you using as, like, definite? Usually, I mean, so, you know, they're followed in spina bifida clinic pretty closely. So we have the input from both the physical therapists that are following them, the PMR uh, doctors as well, urology, which they see on a pretty routine basis. So in general, if they have any sort of plateau or regression, that's kind of my threshold for recommending it, especially to if, you know, their, their back looks really fibrotic, if their skin feels very hard. I think in those particular cases, I'm a little bit more aggressive about recommending it. Yeah, that's definitely a whole nother topic in of itself, right? The, yeah. the fetoscopic versus open fetal and, um, you know, the detethering for that. So absolutely. Well, I think um, we're wrapping up here. So I wanted to thank all of you um, for joining us and um, for, you know, giving the talks and being available. Um, and so, um, you know, something that we'll have to wait and see what the final result is. I'm not sure we'll ever have uh, concrete answers, but I wanted to thank you guys all for participating today with us. Wonderful talk, Steve and Mari, really well done. Thank you. I wanted, so much, guys. I wanted to second the thanks of everyone. Really wonderful discussion and wonderful talks. Um, and our next session uh, will be on April 12th on epilepsy. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Good night. Good night, everyone.